Hello, this is Jimi Hendrix, and uh, here's something for your head. All right, we'd like to welcome to the show author and Hendrix historian Stephen Roby. Steve, how you doing, buddy? Really good. Glad to be on your show. Yeah, we appreciate you coming, uh, not coming out here, but hanging out with us here for a minute. So now, Steve, you've written three books on Hendrix. Why don't you tell us about them? Well, uh, God, it goes back further than that. I started following Hendrix when I was a 12-year-old in San Francisco growing up in the Haight-Ashbury days. And eventually, after a course of doing a bunch of different Hendrix related things in my life, I got around to writing my first book in 2000, and it was published in 2002. It was called Black Gold, The Lost Archives of Jimi Hendrix, and uh, the, full, the foreword was by, written by Noel Redding, Jimmy's bass player. Uh, about eight years after that, in 2010, I wrote my second book called Becoming Jimi Hendrix, and it documents kind of the unknown uh, period of time, his R&B years from 62 to 66. And uh, when, when he's uh, a backup musician for the likes of uh, Little Richard, the Isley Brothers, and Joey D and the Starlighters. So it's kind of a fun, interesting period to delve into. And then the current book is called Hendrix on Hendrix, Interviews and Encounters with Jimi Hendrix. And it's a collection of uh, some of the best interviews he did during the peak of his career, starting with his first interview in 1966 as an unknown guitarist who had just arrived in England and uh, concludes with his final interview given about a week before he died in England in 1970. Now, what do you think it is that after 42 years, 42 years after his death, that keeps guys like me so intrigued by everything about Jimmy? Well, you know, he was really a, a, a different type of guitar player. I mean, once he arrived in England, uh, he, was, uh, he captivated the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and Pete Townsend of The Who. And that spark of playing, that energy that he had then, still sounds fresh today. I mean, I doubt in 42 years from now that we'll be celebrating the music of Justin Bieber or uh, Taylor Swift, for that matter of fact. It just, you know, today's music, not to sound like a cranky old man, but today's music just doesn't have that same soul uh, that's, that you can find in Jimmy's music. Well, you're preaching to the choir there because I totally agree. <laughs> Uh, now, so what do you think it is? Like, I, one thing I used to, I really love about all of my favorite guitar, well, well three, my three top guitar players, which are Hendrix, Robin Trower, and Steve Ray Vaughan, is, like, they're such, such humble people. You hear them in interviews, they're so nice. Uh, and In fact, the, the, what I loved is Jimmy's interview with Dick Cavett when he says, people consider you one of the greatest guitar players in the world. And he says, no, man, uh, you know, maybe one of the best sitting in this chair. Right. What do you think it was in his life that just really attributed to his humility as a person? Well, you know, it's just the opposite of what he was on stage. Uh, you know, you see him bashing the guitar around, lighting it on, on fire, and just going nuts and everything like that. But off stage, he was a different type of person. Very, high, very humble and very shy and uh, just, you know, the complete ladies' man, if you will. Um, I think that kind of comes from his background, being raised by kind of a rather strict parent, his father, who really taught him um, how to, his manners and how to perform and behave in public and everything like that. And that carried over and, you know, it was just, a, just kind of a, a sign of a true legend, I think, just a really honest, genuine guy. Now, here's a question a lot of people don't ask, but did you like... I mean, the experience, you know, obviously Mitch Mitchell, Noel Redding, a much more active rhythm section, and then you got, you know, Buddy Miles and Billy Cox, a real nice laid back in the pocket kind of uh, rhythm section. Which one did you prefer, or really is it just too hard to pick? Well, boy, that's, that's, that's a really tough question. I mean, it's really hard to pick. I mean, uh, Billy 
and Noel really had a tight thing together, as did Buddy Miles and Billy. And it's just two different types of music trying to compare the two together are like apples and oranges. I mean, uh, the, the Band of Gypsies and Machine Gun just really, and, you know, incredible funk and gut, rhythm, gut bucket rhythm playing so strong. But then you've got, you know, the psychedelic period when Jimmy's getting into uh, kind of that sci-fi uh, sound with uh, Electric Ladyland, that whole third side of the LP, just incredible. Uh, I, you know, I really can't, I can't say I have a favorite. I mean, they're all good. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, what do you think it was that vaulted Jimmy to such heights in England, but you know, wouldn't allow him to crack the market here in the U.S.? You know, he struggled for so long. I mean, the guy was persistent. He never gave up. I mean, he told the reporter that, you know, that's, that's really the key to success is being persistent and being stubborn and sticking with it. And uh, it sure paid off. I mean, four, four years just not getting ahead, even trying to promote himself and turning his guitar up a little too loud, wearing something other than what was the uh, band, regulated band uniform and getting fined for it. He finally broke free in 1966 and made his way down to Greenwich Village and uh, started playing with his own band, Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. And that's really when we start to see Hendrix emerge. I mean, start, I mean, I wish there were recordings from that time period there of him just cutting loose at the Cafe Wa. But, you know, once he got to England and those cats uh, saw him playing, I mean, he brought over with him that authenticity here of learning his chops on the Chitlin circuit, playing with people like uh, Albert Collins and Albert King and B.B. King and, and learning those great rhythm riffs. Uh, you know, that's where it came from. And the people in England, the fans in England, heard that and really fell in love with that. And fortunately here, we were a little slow to catch on.
Now, there's been so many things leaked out over the years on Hendrix, and I always get excited when something new, new hits the market. Uh, Valleys of Neptune, was, I thought, was great. I mean, I really enjoyed that release, and I was so excited when I heard West Coast Seattle Boy was coming out. Mm -hmm. But when it came out, I kind of felt like, eh, maybe they're drawn for straws here a little bit. Uh, I, wonder, I almost wonder if Hendrix would have wanted that released. I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, West Coast Seattle Boy, uh, you know, I had higher hopes for that, too. Um, you know, I kind of wished that they paid a little bit more attention to the liner notes. Uh, there's some factual errors there, especially on the early stuff, and what was uh, actually more better documented in my book, if I could toot my own horn there, becoming Jimi Hendrix. Um, I know what you're, you're saying. Uh, box sets are uh, kind of get a little misguided now and then. I mean, it was just kind of uh, the, the second box set that Hendrix, ex Experience Hendrix put out, I thought was much better. There was a better quality material here. This seemed uh, to be kind of hit and miss, and um, hopefully they'll get it together better there. What I would personally like to see is the black gold suite of music uh, that they experienced. Hendrix said they didn't have, now they say they do have, and they let out a uh, track from that on West Coast Seattle Boy called uh, Suddenly Last November. And uh, if they would get around and release that, I don't know if there's a wide enough commercial market for that. That is something I think Hendrix fans will really enjoy. Now, I, I don't know if you ever got to see the Experience Hendrix tour, but I went and checked it out last year, or maybe it was last year, year before, at the Fox Theater. I'm, I was expecting a lot. I mean, seeing a lineup of all these top-notch guitar players, but I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit more of a purist. I was a little bit disappointed with the, the, how wide of an interpretation of Hendrix's music there was. Um, what do you think about it? Do you like those where they're interpreted, or do you like more of the, a little more traditional interpretation of Jimmy's stuff? You know, I never got around to seeing the uh, Experience Hendrix tour uh, that came around several times to the San Francisco Bay Area there. And, but I've heard great things about it. You know, I've seen tons of guitar players uh, try to imitate uh, Jimmy. I think Randy Hansen comes about the closest there. I mean, I've seen him play a couple of live gigs in San Francisco where he uh, takes the guitar out into the street and keeps playing and even tackles uh, some of the harder to play Hendrix songs live. I imagine songs like uh, 1983, A Merman I Should Turn to Be. Let's make the play. They also the 
hands to my face. He said, anyway, we will. Well. We will be beyond the will of God. Man, in the grace of the day. Uh, I think Randy's got it. You know, I, it, I, there's really nothing negative that can be said about uh, people that play Jimmy's music. I mean, that's what he really wanted. And uh, to keep that alive, keep the legacy and the spirit alive, I think it, it, it's, it's all good. I totally agree. I think Randy is just a phenomenal guitar player, and I love the fact that he keeps the traditional vibe and, like you said, just covers so much of Hendrix stuff that nobody touches. I mean, a lot of guys hit you know, Purple Haze, Voodoo Child, that kind of thing. But Randy just really digs deep and, and does an absolutely phenomenal job. Exactly. A funny quick story for you. Uh, back in 1995, I was uh, co-producing uh, this Jimi Hendrix Electric Guitar Festival uh, for the Bumper Shoot uh, uh, Festival that was going up on Seattle in 1995. Uh, the Hendrix family had just got the rights back to the music, and so it was a big celebration there. Uh, they flew in people like Vernon Reed, uh, Billy Cox was there, and all these uh, legendary guitar players, John McLaughlin. But those guys hadn't played Jimmy's music out on the road as much as Randy did, and they're all kind of looking around, scratching their foreheads, trying to guess how the song patterns go. But once Randy showed up at rehearsals, you know, he just played it like he was, you know, just reading a nursery rhyme, you know. And these guys were standing back in awe. It was a, it was a fun sight to see. <laughs> So, in your opinion, what do you think was the pinnacle of Hend Hendrix's career? Boy, <laughs> that's, a, that's another really tough question to, to nail that on to. Uh, you know, gosh, Electric Ladyland really does it for me. But then again, you know, the Band of Gypsies period, too. Uh, we start to see uh, a shift in 1970 as Hendrix, uh, you know, what we saw in The Cry of Love and the Rainbow Bridge album. But would have been, you know, start to see him get into better studio production, a better quality studio. The material that was recorded at Electric Lady Studios in 1970 is phenomenal. I mean, he's using 36 tracks now. And it's just kind of a hint to uh, see what might have happened if he had continued on with better production, uh, better engineering, and the sound quality was just phenomenal. So, you know, we'll, I, I don't think we'll ever see what, what happened next. I mean, for me, it kind of left off at Electric Lady Land here. Now, in your second book, you talk about becoming Jimi Hendrix and, you know, his life as a side man and that type of thing. Is that how he developed his, that great, like, the chord embellishment style he does, like on Little Wing and Angel and Castles Made of Sand and Wind Cries Mary? Exactly. I mean, if you go back and you listen to some of those uh, recordings there done with the, uh, well, not so much with Little Richard, but with the Isley Brothers, you know, you can just hear that driving rhythm that's coming through. And some of the softer material, too. Uh, for example, uh, the, the track with Little Richard that he plays, I don't know what you've got, but it, it's got me. I mean, you can hear that mellow tone that comes through on Angel, too. So, yeah, you know, it all comes from somewhere. And Jimmy was listening to records before he got out on the road in 1962 uh, with those guys learning his chops there. So, you know, he's paying tribute to Curtis Mayfield and other guitar players like that. And it certainly comes back in songs like Angel. Now, do you feel like uh, Jimmy maybe felt a little bit of culture shock and a little, um, almost a little scared after going from such a, a diverse Seattle neighborhood to hitting Nashville where there was segregation or hitting the East Coast where things were a little bit rougher. Yeah, you know, um, that kind of comes out in becoming Jimi Hendrix and uh, some of the people that I interviewed him and talked about that. I mean, it was his first visit to Harlem and uh, thankfully he had lithophane prison uh, guiding him through some of the steps there and uh, when he got turned down at several nightclubs for trying to sit in with the regular local guitar players you know he really got an education quick and uh, it was a good le learning period I mean Jimmy had tough skin to put up with that especially uh, 
on the Chitlin circuit, there's an incident that uh, Bobby Womack talks about in uh, his autobiography about uh, the time that uh, somebody accused Jimmy of stealing money from them, and for as part of payback, they took Hendrix's guitar and threw it out of a uh, tour bus while the bus was going down a country road. So yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy not only learned his, his musical chops on the road, but he learned how life is in uh, different cities, especially in the South and in New York. Now, what did you think about the recent Blu-ray release of Jimmy Plays Berkeley? Well, that, that's a tough one. Probably picked the wrong guy to answer that question there. I mean, I saw the first Berkeley uh, 1970 show there. I was 15 years old at the time. Stood in line with the rest of the hippies trying to get in. Uh, heard the afternoon rehearsals as my parents dropped me off in front of the Berkeley Community Theater. I mean, those great hurt rehearsals of him doing uh, blue suede shoes and things like that. That was blasting out into the streets uh, when you pulled up in front of the Berkeley Community Theater. And just an amazing show. So every time I see that, I just harken back to my uh, inner memories of what it was like being a 15-year-old and uh, watching him you know, about 15 rows away uh, from the stage there. Oh, it's funny. Me and my best friend used to rent, I think we used to go to Blockbuster and we were renting Jimmy Plays Berkeley on VHS tape like 30 times. <laughs> that version of Johnny Be Good on there is, I mean, obviously he only played it that one time, but it was just amazing. I was kind of disappointed, though, because I feel like they should have put in the entire version of Hear My Train A-Coming. Even with the extended parts they added in, that version of Hear My Train is, to me, the best version, hands down, of any other you know, version of that tune he's done live. And I was really disappointed not to see that. Or they'd, they really filled with adding audio but not adding video and you know, adding like, uh, other clips outside the venue rather than inside. So like I said, I was so excited about that, thinking I'd get the full thing, but we really didn't. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you, Mark. Um, that version is just the best version of Hear My Train to Come in the sound quality and his uh, representation of that song is just phenomenal. Um, you know, you got to understand, too, that uh, over the years, the people that handled Jimmy's um, recordings and videos and things like that didn't do the best job. A lot of things ended up on the cutting room floor and were taken out to the garbage and we'll never see again. Now, something really interesting I always noticed, I've watched, like, every Hendrix thing possible. Well, I guess I can't say everything possible. You've probably seen more than me and you saw him live, so that's a big difference. But it's funny, every time... You know, you watch like a Beatles concert or you watch another band and the crowd's going crazy. But when Hendrix played, it's like when he got done playing a song, they were just like mesmerized. Like they didn't even know what hit him. Do you think it was just way over their head or? Exactly. It's funny, uh, getting back to that Berkeley show, I didn't see that so much as I did when I saw him a year before at the Oakland Coliseum in 1969. Uh, then it was just crazy fans going wild. But here it was kind of a more... Uh, refined crowd, which was surprising. I mean, for Berkeley in 1970, uh, the guys I were sitting, I was sitting behind, uh, were talking about his guitar techniques and uh, almost joked, uh, you know, that he was going to play a song called Isabella, which was the B side of a new single that had just come out called Stepping Stone, and it, you know, it wasn't practically the best Hendrix song playing. But I mean, these guys were uh, critiquing his guitar playing, the guys that were sitting in front of me, and here I was enjoying the show. Uh, inhaling the huge mist that was coming through the crowd of, of pot smoke, and, and it, was, it was just phenomenal, <laughs> fun thing to watch. Now, it's funny, people always talk about Jimmy's drug use and that kind of stuff, but I always wondered, I'm like, there's no way that he was high all the time, and with all that awesome music he put out in such a short amount of time, and, uh, and then finally I saw an interview with Mitch Mitchell, and Mitch Mitchell totally debunked that and said, look, you know, we get done with the show, and it'd be 3 o'clock in the morning, we're all sleeping on the airplane. He's sitting with a pen and paper, writing new music, sitting there with his guitar. He said he was just a tireless worker writing music. And I have to believe that because it just seems impossible to release that much great music in that short of a span. Uh, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I, I agree with you, and I agree with Mitch entirely. I mean, for him to put out that volume, and uh, Noel Redding, in fact, talks in his autobiography about how what a relentless taskmaster Jimmy was in the studio. I mean, when Noel felt they got the take after the fifth take and they were ready to wrap it up and move on to the next song, Jimmy would call for another 35 takes of the same song. I mean, that's not a guy that's just stoned out on drugs and pot and 
what have you. I mean, this guy had a serious ear for music, and he was really trying to implement that and get the best sound possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's just amazing what he left us. I mean, it's certainly not the example of, of what, what you would get from some, uh, you know, constant drug user. Now, the, people always say that Chaz Chandler was kind of like, kept Jimmy high a lot of the time, and Michael Jeffers bullied him. Um, do you think that, did he, for, well, first of all, did he ever have a caretaker for him or a manager that actually took care of him the correct way and looked out for him? And do you think it was the music business that actually killed him? Oh, boy, that's a, that's a really loaded question there, uh, Mark. Um, no, he really didn't have a person, uh, a wife, a, a solid girlfriend to look out for, out for him. I mean, it was a new town. It was a new place to stay. Uh, it was a new girlfriend that would watch him while he was in town, and then it was on to the next town. You know, I would have loved to see Jimmy get married and kind of settle down and kind of sit back and get some... Uh, better business advice. I mean, Richie Havens, uh, the great folk uh, guitar player, uh, tried to do that at the end uh, in 1970 when Hendrix came to him and said, you know, I don't like my recording contract. I don't like what's going on business-wise. I don't think my money is being handled properly. You know, what do you think I should do about that? And Richie suggested that he go see his attorney uh, and talk about getting some better representation. I mean, it's obvious that Hendrix wanted out of his contract in 1970, but he was kind of bound by what Michael Jeffrey had put down. I mean, the the building of uh, the Electric Lady Studios in 1970 cost a fortune, and when Hendrix died, all he really had left, according to uh, uh, what has been discovered, it was about a half a million dollars to his name, which doesn't sound quite right. I mean, you know, if he had lived and he got a proper attorney, I'm sure you know, they would have uncovered millions of dollars that uh, should have been in Jimmy's name. Now, I heard that Jimmy wanted to make an album with Miles Davis, and he also wanted to record one with an orchestra. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. In fact, uh, Miles Davis talks about that in his autobiography. Uh, they, the two got together by way of a mutual friend, producer Alan Douglas in 1969. Jimmy was hanging out in New York, and uh, Miles Davis was too, and they're... Uh, Acquaintance occurred at a uh, boutique, a uh, fashion boutique uh, by Alan Douglas's wife. Uh, it was called the uh, Nudist Colony, and uh, she had some unusual clothing and uh, things inside the store, and the two of them met. And Alan Douglas, you know, brilliantly said, let's get the two of these guys to get set up a recording session. And unfortunately, uh, Jimmy was there, but Davis called to the studio and said, uh, you know, well, do the session, but I want $50,000 up front. And Douglas said, no, you know, this is kind of a test rehearsal session just to see how it goes. And then Tony Williams, the drummer for the session, uh, didn't know that Miles had call, already called, but also called and demanded $50,000 too. So unfortunately, that session never took place. But uh, there's some other uh, documented incidences where Hendrix said that it looks like maybe sometime in the future, the two of them were going to get together. Uh, he really wanted to get together and do something with Gil Evans. Uh, Quincy Jones told me that uh, he had booked some studio time for Jimmy and was going to do a session with him in 1970. But I think Hendrix was a little too intimidated by jazz. Uh, I think if he got in the studio and kind of heard some of that rock sound uh, that Davis and others were starting to uh, elaborate on, I think he would have been involved with him. But have seen some incredible albums. Oh, yeah, because Miles did get into uh, a phase with, like, uh, you know, Stern and Schofield and stuff where it kind of had a rock feel to it, even though it was jazzy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, listen to uh, In a Silent Way and Bitches Brew and the albums that followed after that. And I think you're really going to feel, I mean, I could certainly hear Hendrix coming in now and then. I think it would have worked. Now we're talking about how great that version, er, not version, but the only time they played Johnny Be Good together, uh, Hendrix and Billy Cox at... Uh, Berkeley, Billy Cox was telling a story about how him and Jimmy were sitting backstage at this show and they never rehearsed the song. But he said, and Jimmy told him, Hey, do you remember Johnny Be Good from when we used to play it in the Army or wherever? He, yeah. He said, uh, Yeah, why? He says, No, I know it better than you. He said, Oh, man, it's on. And they went out there. And that version is just, I think it's timeless. And as well as you, you don't hear anything about that song, Pass It On, that they played at Berkeley, which was pretty darn cool. Uh, why didn't they ever play that stuff again? 
Well, uh, it was Pass It On was a prelude to uh, the song Jimmy did later uh, called Straight Ahead. It was just in the developmental stages, mm -hmm. and Hendrix uh, hadn't really given it a title. Pass It On was kind of a working title, which later uh, became uh, Straight Ahead. And so, as you'll hear in some of the other concerts, uh, like Atlanta, the, the song becomes Straight Ahead. Oh. Now, Jimmy once said that if he did not have a family or a wife and kids, he felt like it wasn't worth going on. Do you think that was it just a huge contributor to his downfall? Well, you know, I think he was reaching out in that particular interview that was done shortly before his death, uh, trying to look for some kind of uh, solid home life, a uh, time to kind of maybe pull away from the uh, music business for a while and try to uh, just, you know, have a regular home, a place to call home away from that. I mean, uh, I tend to look at what the Rolling Stones were doing at that time. They had just got their own record label and got some um, security and some independence and kind of called their own shots. And I think if Jimmy had lived at least, you know, within another two years, maybe 71 or 72, uh, we certainly would have seen that independence come through. So now Jimmy's getting huge in Europe. What was it, what station here finally took the chance to put his music on? Uh, in America, for me, uh, what I heard was KMPX, the station I was listening to in San Francisco. Uh, back then, it was called an underground rock station, and uh, they were on the far end of the channel, and they, were, uh, they would play full album size of music, not just you know one or two tracks that you you'd hear on AM at the time. And uh, there was only about five FM stations, and they were broadcasting in stereo, and it's, it's hard to believe that in the late 1960s, you know, stereo was such a big thing. And so this particular station that I was tuned into said they were the first station in America to play Hendrix because they got an advanced copy uh, from a British station who had, who had got it from the BBC and they, you know, so they sent it over to, to San Francisco and it was a big deal. And so that's, that's what sparked my ears and I ran down to my local record shop who happened to also carry British imports and picked up an early copy of uh, Are You Experienced? Now, I'm going to name an album, and I want you to give me your thoughts on that album. Okay. Are you experienced? One of the best. I mean, uh, third stone from the sun. Oh, my God. <laughs> if that doesn't take you places, nothing else will.
and acts as bold as love. What a sweet album. I mean, you know, it really, it was trying to be radio friendly, but it was never got played on the radio. There was a couple of singles that they pulled off that, that had radio potential, but it wasn't AM enough. I mean, what two tracks that stand out for me on that album are If Six Was Nine and uh, Bold Is Love. I mean, those two are phenomenal. I have to give it to um, uh, Up From The Skies, too. Uh, to me, I really hear Mo's Allison coming through on that. I feel, I feel like that album really was the, the peak of Hendrix's rhythm style, that really cool, kind of underrated. I think it, it probably didn't get the oomph it was supposed to get because it was kind of subtle, but when, you're, when people sat back and actually really listened to that rhythm style below, like Little Wing, Castles Made of Sand, and the song Acts as Bold as Love, I think uh, it, it took a little time to sink in, but I think people really appreciated that after a while. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Little Wing, too. There's another one I forgot there. But uh, the, the songs were so short. I think Jimmy really wanted to expand and do something different. I mean, he starts to show his frustration in an interview that he did with a guy named Meatball Fulton in December of 1967, and he just wasn't satisfied with the sound. I mean, Jimmy was talking about having kind of a 3D surround sound back at that time, but it just wasn't coming through. And finally, I think I started to hear that on uh, Electric Ladyland. Uh, the album that followed that. Oh, that's how I was going to ask you next, Electric Ladyland. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, one of my favorites. I mean, two full LPs of Jimmy's music. Yeah, there's a couple of fillers here and there, here and there on the second side, Burning of the Midnight Lamp, which we hadn't heard in America before. There's so much that Electric La Ladyland has to offer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's blues, there's jazz, there's rhythm and blues, and there's some funk there with uh, Rainy Day, Dream Away. And even for the science fiction fans, that love Jimmy's music. You've got 1983, an incredible suite of music. Yeah, oh, I love that song, Rainy Day, Dream Away. And, I mean, not to mention the fact of All Along the Watchtower, where he took Bob Dylan's song to, like, way new heights. I mean, that solo is just classic in there. Yeah, I think that song really defines uh, the late 60s, and especially the Vietnam War era. All right, Band of Gypsies. Band of Gypsies, oh my God, I would listen to that LP over and over. I drove my parents crazy with the headphones on there, uh, especially Machine Gun, over and over. I think it was Ernie Isley who said, that solo is the closest human hands will ever get to the hands of God. And I think he really nailed it there, that whole album there. It's unfortunate that, that it hasn't been released in its entirety with each track flowing into the others. It's just kind of chopped up bits and pieces there. I mean, you really, I think to appreciate it, you really need to hear all those concerts on one uh, CD box set. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, I wore the grooves out of that album, and I found the German import so I could hear the, the version of Hear My Train to comment on it. That's a, I'd say that's my second favorite version to Hear My Train behind Berkeley. Yeah, he was cooking that night there, too. It's funny, uh, the, that show, uh, those shows uh, from the Fillmore East, Got some bum reviews. I mean, people weren't ready for that style of music to come out of Jimmy. They wanted to hear the favorites like Hey Joe and Foxy Lady and Purple Haze, which he kept toward the end of the show there. But uh, Bill Graham kind of, I think, coaxed him to get out there and play some of those favorite hits. But when Jimmy and Buddy and Billy cut loose on some of that gut bucket fun, funk, you know, it's just incredible, you know? And it's funny, we really almost missed out on that, right? Because didn't you release that album only because he had a contractual agreement to fulfill? Right. Uh, the, there was a New York per, uh, producer in 1965 that Jimmy signed a $1 contract with at the time for a three-year binding contract. And when Hendrix became a superstar over in Europe, uh, this producer started putting out some of these kind of eh, shabby 1965, 1966 recordings that Jimmy was involved with that he really didn't want released, especially at the time of when Are You Experience and Access Bold came, as, came about. So to settle the agreement, uh, Capitol Records, the record company that the New York record producer was using at the time, got a live album, The Band of Gypsies, at Fillmore East. But it really didn't satisfy him, and this guy wanted more and continued uh, to get future royalties off of uh, Jimmy's music. Now, on the album Crash Landing, I absolutely love that song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Now, I've heard that Jimmy does not play the entire solo. They had another guitar player come in and finish the solo. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, um, Alan Douglas, once again, uh, the guy you met in 1969. He was, uh, I got to know Alan quite well, and he was one of those people that felt 
Jimmy's mistakes, nobody should ever hear them. And he made a statement to me once that if it were up to him, and it was up to him, uh, that he would like to burn all of Jimmy's outtakes and mistakes. And that's kind of what he did with Crash Landing and the album that followed it, um, Midnight Lightning. And he just wanted to get the perfect sound of what he thought the rhythm players should fill in, the parts that were incomplete, uh, the drumming wasn't up to his par. And so what Alan did at the time was get all these session players that really never knew Jimmy or had a chance to record with him come in and finish these unfinished parts to these songs. But if you listen to the unedited, uh, not the unedited, but un, uh, embellished versions of the songs that appeared on Crash Landing, they're actually quite good. Uh, there was a lot of splicing and editing, and Alan finally uh, caught some flack for doing that uh, in later years, but <laughs> he was just a, such a perfectionist like Jimmy, and he just wanted something as clean as possible. Now, one of the most iconic photos of Hendrix is him burning the guitar at Monterey. It seems like people that don't know a lot about Hendrix, that's the first thing they think about, and they kind of get the idea he was like Pete Townsend smashing his guitars every show, but they don't realize he only did that one time. He was a lot more relaxed than that on stage. Uh, I mean, how did he, did that ever kind of hinder Jimmy in a way because people were expecting that when he got to different cities? Uh, it did. Uh, actually, that was, Monterey was the second time Jimmy burned his guitar. He did it kind of as a stunt uh, over at the Seville Theater in 1967 uh, just to kind of test things out, and, and it seemed to work. And so uh, Monterey Pop was his American debut, so they wanted to stand out from the other acts on the, on the bill, especially the Who, who did something similar, but didn't, uh, Pete didn't light his guitar on fire. But, you know, it's funny in some of the reviews that you read uh, post-Monterey, uh, the fans, and you can hear that on some of the uh, unreleased audio tapes too, fans were crying out for him to, uh, to burn the guitar and asking, will he burn it tonight? You know, so it became kind of what fans thought was a staple shtick that Jimmy would do, was burn his guitar on stage. But it was just a one-time thing, something just to kind of go crazy and wild. I mean, yeah, of course he did smash his amp and smash his guitar and other things, but he really wanted fans to listen to his playing, listen to the music, and play what he called uh, electric church music, something that they could go to the concert and the sound would kind of reach a deeper level, uh, not just through the eardrums, but reach his, their souls and offer fans a, a different type of, some sort of solution to the chaos that was going on in the late, in, late 1960s. Wow. Now, Lemmy Kilmeister of Motorhead was a roadie of Jimmy's. And he used to always, uh, he tells the, the stories about how much he used to love just sitting there and laughing at watching uh, Clapton and Townsend sitting there with their mouths open while they were watching Jimmy play. And he tells the story about he, how he used to have to hold the Marshall stacks up while Jimmy acted like he was humping them. Uh, did, have you ever talked to Lemmy about uh, his days as a roadie with Jimmy? No, I never talked to Lemmy. He's just one of the few people I haven't reached out to yet. Well, now, there's so many things out with Hendrix now, from a golf club to there's a clothing line coming out. Are you starting to feel a little bit like Jimmy's image is getting exploited? Well, that was one of the reasons why I left Experience Hendrix. I mean, I worked for them for about close to two years. Uh, I felt in a small way I kind of helped uh, Experience Hendrix, actually Al Hendrix, Jimmy's father, get, get the rights back to his music in 1995. They had a lawsuit going uh, against Leo Branton, Alan Douglas, and, and others. Uh, the rights and images uh, were about to be sold to some overseas investors and who knows what would have happened then. But, you know, I helped them in a small way. They got the rights to the music back, and I went to work for Experience Hendrix as their fanzine editor. But while I was working for them, uh, they started putting out some questionable products, I thought, in my mind, like Jimi Hendrix golf balls. And uh, they showed me one time a, uh, a rocking chair with Jimmy's face on the seat, and so you would actually sit on Jimmy's face, <laughs> mind you. And then uh, what was kind of the turning point for me was when they put out uh, Jimi Hendrix Red Wine, which was the stuff that he uh, choked on oh. on the, the night that he died. And, you know, I went to them. I said, do you know that this is the stuff your brother uh, died, uh, drank the night he died? And, you know, here's his face on the, the, the label of this bottle of wine. And I said, you know, really, I, I can't continue to work for you any longer. This is just a very untasteful uh, product. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if they're still putting out the uh, the, the sketchy products like um, Jimi Hendrix uh, 
uh, baby diapers anymore, but you know, I, hopefully they'll get their act together better. <laughs> now, Jimmy was kind of a, you wrote in your book that he was also kind of a civil rights activist. He got arrested in Nashville. Do you think it was kind of a paradox that he ended up getting idolized by a white audience? And do you think that caused any friction between him and his community? Well, you know, you can kind of certainly see that and hear that when he played when he came back to back to play Harlem in 1969. Uh, the uh, there was kind of a free concert that was given after Woodstock, and Hendrix played uh, to a black all black audience there in Harlem. There, uh, unfortunately, the recording is not the greatest, but from some of the, some of the people who attended it said they really rather see some of the blues acts on the bill. Hendrix wasn't getting played on black radio at the time. It was too rough. It was too rock and was too loud at the time, unfortunately. Uh, Hendrix, uh, in one of the articles, interviews in my book, Hendrix on Hendrix, uh, he talks about the Black Panthers. He really didn't want to make a connection with him other than this one interview that was done shortly after the uh, Summer Olympics in 1968. I mean, you have to remember these were very violent, chaotic times in America. We just lost Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, the Democratic Convention, the riots in the streets. It was a crazy time, but nothing seemed to be coming together. And in this interview uh, from 1968, Hendricks talks about getting the Black Panthers to do something. He doesn't really define it, but he says to do something that would scare the U.S. government into getting something together, some sort of solution that would kind of uh, cross the barriers between old and young and black and white and get something together. But, you know, he goes on a little bit far further and says, you know, it something has to be done. I know it sounds like uh, war, but, you know, if the peaceful solution isn't happening, something has got to happen. And it sounds like he's talking about revolution here. Oh. John Stewart has a clip on the internet uh, called Are You Exploited, where he talks about the Hendrix family unearthing Jimmy's coffin and selling the stones around it. Is there any truth to that? Jimi Hendrix's body to be reburied by family. Memorial will raise money for Jimi Hendrix's family. <laughs> Rock legend Jimi Hendrix will make another appearance in Seattle very soon as the family of the famed guitarist plans to dig up his body and sell the dirt and stones, hopefully digging deep enough to catch a glimpse of the hell that will one day welcome them. <laughs> Some Hendrix loyalists have vowed to form a human blockade around the star's gravesite, which officials fear could leave the candle, poem, and flower ramparts at Strawberry Fields dangerously undermanned. <laughs> Stones from the gravesite, which will be packaged in purple and gold, are described as, quote, simple but cool, and are said to look great with your rock and roll memorabilia. No doubt it would fit right in on a memento shelf between Buddy Holly's dental records and a slice of glazed ham from the sandwich that killed Mama Cass. And that was this just in. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I think I might be the one that posted that on YouTube there. Somebody sent me that. And uh, yeah, that was one of those things that they were doing there after Experience Hendrix just had taken over. Uh, they hired an outside, if I recall, I may have some of the facts wrong, but they hired an outside consulting company to, to um, merchandise these rocks and stones and bricks uh, that fans could have their name on that would be part of this new mausoleum in uh, Renton, Washington, where Jimmy's buried uh, at the Greenwood Memorial Cemetery. Um, prior to that, there was just a headstone with a guitar on it that said, um, Forever in Our Hearts, you know, James Marshall Hendrix and a guitar, and uh, that was it. I mean, to me, that was just simple enough. But the cemetery was complaining that they had so many visitors, thousands and thousands of visitors every year, that they had to do something because these fans, some not well-intentioned, would steal flowers off of other, other graves sites, put them on Jimmy's. Uh, you would go up there and you would find all these uh, etchings and rubbings people would take um, white sheets of paper and take crayons and chalk and do a rubbing against the headstone there and save that as a souvenir but you know the other grave sites would get trampled on the grass would be torn up so the, the family and uh, the cemetery came together with some sort of solution and that was to move Jimmy from that grave site to this big kind of I think almost overdone uh, tribute column thing that they have up there now 
Uh, it is, it's a great place for fans to gather. It doesn't uh, disturb any of the other grave sites. But what's really sad, I think, is that Jimmy's mother, Lucille, is buried way across on the other side of the cemetery. And I think Jimmy would have wanted her to be connected with him somehow. Oh. Now, why was there such a long battle over the rights to Jimmy's music? Uh, I guess you're talking about the uh, 1995 lawsuit uh, that happened there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the Hendrix family members spoke up at the time and realized that if this business uh, transaction would have happened, would have uh, gone over to some other investors overseas, and who knows how it would have been. It seemed like at the time the right thing was to do was revert everything back to the Hendrix family. I mean, you got to understand, too, that Al Hendrix, God bless him, all he was getting every year since Jimmy died was a check for $50,000. That's good money for a entire landscape artist, which it was, uh, but not for the father. You know, something had to be done, and it seemed like the right thing to do was have every, everything uh, go back to his family. Unfortunately, one of the family that wasn't included was Leon, Jimmy's blood brother. Oh. So, what's left now in the archives for Jimmy? Any new songs, new video footage, uh, full concerts? I mean, I wish, I wonder if there's any secret, any type of footage that's better from the Band of Gypsies show. Boy, I, I personally don't think so. I mean, I wish it was better recorded. There's little color footage of that that's been synced and looks really good. What really Hendrix fans are really craving for is the Royal Albert Hall footage. Uh, there's a bootleg copy of that, of the show that was done in 1969, but it's kind of hippy-dippy. Uh, some of the uh, concert footage is uh, merged with uh, waves crashing on a beach. Uh, there's fireworks going off. Uh, but these guys uh, followed Hendrix around through part of his European tour in early 69 and captured the full uh, February 24th, 1969 concert. And if they can ever get that together, I think that's probably about as best quality of your footage we're going to see for things to come. Oh. Now, the book, it's been, so many things have been written about Jimmy's death, uh, especially recently with Tapia Wright coming out and talking about, you know, Michael Jeffers. What do you think happened? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's another, another long-answered question. I'll try to give you the short version. In none of my books, I really don't try to cover that because I feel that we really don't know exactly what happened. The person that Jimmy was with that evening uh, eventually committed suicide in 1996, I believe it was, and she took with her whatever happened that night. I think her story kept changing uh, uh, depending on who was asking her the question there. In fact, if you go to my website, steveroby.com, R-O-B-Y, uh, you can read an unpublished interview with her that was done in 1994. She describes some of the things that happened during that final week with Jimmy. Uh, let me set the stage for you really quick. Uh, Jimmy played his last uh, concert in, in September of 6th of 1970. His band dissolved pretty much after that. Uh, Billy Cox went back to recuperate in the, in the United States after uh, trying LSD unbeknownst to him it was a punch that he drank was spiked with LSD it was his first LSD experience and it was really bad so he's out of the picture Mitch Mitchell's wife just had just given birth to a baby Mitch is out of the picture so Jimmy's looking to fulfill his record contract with a record company who are craving for a new album I mean he hadn't put anything out in the studio since 1968 here it is 1970 they want the new studio album fi finished uh, there's a European tour lined up that, that needs to be complete, completed, but Hendrix doesn't have a, a band put together yet. So he hangs out in England, and he's, he's t spending some time with a lady he briefly met in 1969. Uh, the two of them were together, and unfortunately, the last evening he was with, he tried some of her uh, painkillers. They were a German brand of painkillers called Vesperax. Uh, what wasn't explained to him, perhaps, was that these were a very strong dose. They needed to be, either be broken into halves or thirds uh, for the normal dosage. 
Uh, Hendricks took none of them. Uh, what I don't understand is why she, the lady he was with at the time, didn't explain to him that they were that strong and kind of supervise him. She admits that uh, she noticed he was getting sick but goes out for a pack of cigarettes and so we're calling the paramedics right away. Uh, she called Eric Burden at least twice, maybe three times, for calling the paramedics. And that's kind of where the stories differ. Uh, some say that Hendricks was alive when he went to the hospital. Others claim that uh, some of the people that they have interviewed say that uh, when the paramedics showed up, uh, that Hendricks had been dead for five hours. Uh, Tappy Wright has claimed that uh, Jimmy's manager, Michael Jeffrey, uh, wanted Jimmy dead because uh, he was worth to him more dead than alive because of a life insurance policy. And then you have the other conspiracy theory uh, that the American government, the CIA and the FBI, wanted Jimmy dead because he was sympathizing with the anti-war uh, movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, he had uh, sided supposedly in their minds with the Black Panther movement, and they wanted him dead. So, you know, pick your theory and go with it. Uh, we lost one of the greatest guitar players I think I've ever seen, perhaps, to come along. And uh, it, that's the sad part. I mean, we should really enjoy his life and the music that he left us. I don't think we'll ever solve it. Some people say they've solved the mystery of how he died. But, you know, <laughs> I don't think we'll ever know. <laughs> Steve, we want to thank you very, very much for taking the time out to talk to us. And now where can people find you online and where can they buy your books? Uh, I have a website set up uh, called steveroby.com. Uh, there's links there to buy my book on Amazon. But if you want a signed first edition copy, there's also a link that company uh, that I've signed some books for you if you want um, first edition a hardcover copy. And I'm really happy to announce, too, that the book is uh, now on the LA Times bestseller for nonfiction hardcover. Uh, I'm really thrilled about that. All right, once again, thank you very much, Stephen, for taking the time out to hang with us. Stephen Roby, Hendricks historian, author, cool guy. We got to get him out to Detroit. Okay, my pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. From T Town to your town, we're coming your way. When you see the D fly, you better cheer the brave. Welcome to the King Nats Crown. We're from Detroit City. We're the